Well, as I always say, we're not on the record. We're right? we are, we just started. I'll say it anyhow. Uh, <laughs> when I was, we were told that uh, the vote was 11 nothing on on the uh, workforce capacity bill. I said, that's been the same case for 30 years in House Congress. <laughs> I've only been here for a few years. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. We're going to start. We have Representative Jerome here. We're going to. And Karen, too. And Karen's here. And David Hall's, I think, in the wings. Oh, is that you? So, this is our first look at this bill. Okay. So, uh, why don't you, uh, the floor is yours. Why don't you tell us what you want to tell us about the bill? Uh, sure. So, did you want to walk through the bill? I mean, you. That's uh, okay. I have a lot to talk. Right. Tell us about the need and the, uh, the idea and what you're trying to accomplish. Sure. So, um, H64, an accolade is supporting creative sector businesses and cultural organizations. And it's to provide grants and other incentives to support creative sector businesses and cultural organizations that have been impacted by COVID 19. So, I, you know, I guess I, I just want to give you some. A, a, Maybe a snapshot. Like when I'm looking at you know my own small town that I represent, I was branded. That the, the town of four thousand people has opera house. It has a art gallery, a cooperative art gallery. It has a town hall venue, a nonprofit, a for profit performing arts spaces, and multiple artist studios and art, um, independent artists. Artists. A great group. golf course. And a good golf course. And a very good golf course. Right. So, and great restaurants and a couple of brewers. You know, so it is like a snap. I think it's a snapshot of of what of small Vermont. And, and it's a the Vermont's a work and Brandon is a is a working class town. It's 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 it would identify itself as a work. And how many people in Brandon? Four thousand. So a good snapshot of what this is. And I think this is repeated, and I know this is repeated over and over again throughout the state. It makes up our cultural fabric, and I think that's sort of important to remember. And it is um so the economic impact of the arts is duplicated in rural and urban areas throughout the state. It attracts the residents and it brings them back on opportunity. And I'm going to start delivering all that. Creative sector represents 9% of our jobs throughout the state. And, uh, but the pandemic has profoundly impacted a huge sector of these creative businesses, including museums and theaters and galleries and studios and performing arts venues. As well as in cultural organizations, as well as artists and architects and curators and crafters and dancers and designers, and the list goes on of the occupations. And this bill would help any enterprise, organization, or individual whose products and services are rooted in the artistic and creative content. So during COVID, 8,000 jobs in the creative sector were lost. And in the Brookings Institute study, estimated that. $216 million in sales was lost between April and July of 2020. It's a significant amount of money. And then in March of 2020, the arts, arts organizations were the first to close and are still sort of the last to reopen. And many, many are still struggling because people are hesitant to come back and they're, they don't feel confident in. Um, Back to the numbers that we saw prior to the Was the 8,000 jobs, is there any number as to how many of the company was 8,000 or something lost from COVID? Uh, I don't know, but we could, we, Karen Middleman could certainly maybe address that. Karen, do you have. Um, we, we could. We could yeah, come back to that. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, so, so now, so looking at you know, this hesitancy of coming back, we need to help these businesses. Now, when they're returning to manage the high cost of COVID, um, the COVID safe supplies to reboot their program, to re engage audiences, and they need to get back on the same, just good sound footing again um, to post COVID 19. So, the bill proposes to provide $17.5 million in financial assistance to the creative sector businesses and cultural organizations. And I'll just run down. The, the program. Uh, the first one is a $10 million. Oh, first of all, let me just go over this. The, what we propose in this bill is to fund the tip, fund $17.5 million will be used, will be used taking the 
remaining funds from the Economic Recovery Grant Program, um, which ACCD administers, and they would subgrant those $17.5 million to the Vermont Arts Council to administer these grants. My understanding is now there's $25.5 million left in that fund that were not dispersed. Um, they're unused. The, the bridge grants did not get out in the, in the manner that they had hoped it would. So the first program is a $10 million in creative economy grants. These are allocated to fund theaters, community art centers, galleries, museums, dance studios, and creative economy businesses and non and nonprofit. So for profit and nonprofit um, for operating support and recovery. It is estimated that they could grant about 250 to 300 um, grants um, in a size about five thousand to two hundred fifty thousand dollars and they're going to base this granting process so vermont arts council had a very successful grant administered about five million dollars of grants during the first uh, round of uh, COVID fund crf funds now and then they've also facing this uh their plan to to provide this money uh, on a program from the state of colorado in their economic development uh, office. And so you say that uh, this first $10 million, you think that there are 250 to 300 grants go out? Yeah. I could do the math, but did you have Yeah, and the, the Arts Council believes that they could there be in a, in a range from small $5,000 grants okay. to $250,000 grants for you know, small organizations, 5,000, a larger organization. Okay. You know, we know those larger, larger organizations, so 250,000. So another program would be two million dollars used for transitional costs for safe public programming. So this would be things like hustle tick ticketing, online sales platforms, and COVID-related health and safety protocols. And they believe they could provide about 300 grants. And just sort of as a point of interest, uh, the Paramount Theater told us that they spend about a, are now spending about a thousand dollars per event to uh, in this in for public safety. That's what they're spending now. Yeah, they're spending yeah. four thousand. A thousand. A thousand per event. Per event, in yeah. order to cover all the public safety protocols. Uh, what theater was that? The flip? Paramount Theater. Oh, Paramount. Paramount. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, we've had some uh, interesting uh, testimony from Eric Millette, uh, who's a who's the executive director at the Paramount. Um, and then the in this section, the last bit of money would be four million dollars to be used for facility adaptations. So these are slightly more expensive things like air purification systems, expanded outdoor seating, HVAC um, assessments, and, and upgrades. And in this area, they believe that they could provide about 80 grants that would range from 20,000 to 100,000 dollars. So in the next section of this bill is um, $500,000 for statewide promotion and marketing of the Vermont's creative sector. And this is to, well, you know, market, so we would provide, um, encouraging people to come back, they more confidence to attending large, um, large gatherings and offices. And that, uh, about 25 to 30 at 30,000. 30, each um, and then the next one would be $250,000 to sustain and build the Vermont Creative Network and a Creative Action Plan. The legislator provided full funding for this for this plan in 2016, so they want to hire a coordinator and zone leaders and continue the work they've done on um, on the so strategic plan and roadmap for economic development of the arts and then the so who, who runs that? The program? Vermont Arts Council. They have an extremely a very interesting document. Um, the council chart. Yeah, Vermont, they, they have a, a strategic plan that is worth looking at. Uh, the last piece is, not almost the last piece, is $750,000 to, uh, and that, that $750,000 is to They'll sort of revitalize downtown and village centers with vacant storefronts, which you know there's been quite a few that come up during the pandemic. And um, that would be to, um, for artists, the rent of the storefronts um, 
and also to perhaps provide additional housing also if that's the best within it. But a good example of that is in Middlebury, there, there was during COVID and during their road construction, uh, there were quite a few empty storefronts in downtown Middlebury, um, which is a stone throw away from the college. And they had a very interesting cooperative program called Bundle, where it was a series of art exhibits, classes, performances. And the town estimated that there was additional um, a direct impact of $250,000 in sales from filling that, tem temporarily filling that storefront. And that program is called Bundle. Bundle. What part of this is envisioned as housing? There so there's so in that $250,000, there is a, an idea that if in a building there was a, a vacant a livable space, it was, you know, could safe, you know, safe livable space that um, it could be rented to an artist and sort of cooperate with the, in it, you know, we're, I guess people were sort of envisioning in a downtown where there was an empty storefront and maybe a little space upstairs that an art, that artist could uh, occupy the spaces. And this is viewed as the grant to the, both the landlord to help finance the transition. Yeah. The transformation of these spaces, right? Right. It, it, this is, although it doesn't say it's that. To, yeah, it is to the, um, Provide rental income to building owners, enabling artists and creative businesses to thrive and spark energy and redevelopment in post COVID downtowns. Right. So, then the very last piece of this um, is $10,000 uh, to fund Farmer Site. Yes, this is very exciting. And through, and actually, I have a, I had a personal story about this is that I was, um, Farmer's Night, I knew it was coming up, and we have this new opera company, and, and Brandon, and I thought how wonderful to maybe get two of the performers to come to the state house and give a presentation And I had no idea that people, if they, unless they were funded through the Humanities Council or perhaps friends of the state house, they, they had no, there was no reimbursement for travel or expenses to come to the state house and perform. I, I had just assumed that there was, and I was embarrassed to say, to find out that I'd asked people to come and spend a day of their time to perform for us without any, any reimbursement. So there's a small allocation of $10,000 um, added on to this, to this bill for that so purpose. This is where our plea to the House Appropriations Committee this is where it ended up. Exactly. And it's a good, it's a good spot for it. It didn't end up in the budget, which is <clears throat> sort of where we were hoping it was going yeah. to end up. But it ended up in this. So, so is it just this, this is a small part of the bill, obviously, but do you view this as a mandate? They can't do this already? It just says it's authorized. It doesn't say that they have to spend it on this. I'm I guess wondering, the, the, the language says, Sorry, you're not right. it's, not, it, it's not, you're right, it, they shall spend this, it should be. And that. are they not able to do this presently? The Correct, Bar? yeah. So there's my understanding money. now is that I have some, I, have, I just pull up the, the oh, there's no money. You know, more we money. never allocate money. For right, money. I know there's no money, but there's no money here either. This is just of their existing budget. They can authorize it. They can use Oh no! It, then that must be in the budget where we've given them ten thousand because we aren't. It's new money. It's ten thousand new money. It's not money she has already. So we'll clarify that with the, the, the Parks Committee and Janet. But I believe this has to be new money. I mean, it, it's intended to be new money, and it's intended to be in addition to what her budget is. It actually, says the opposite. I know. From resources available within the. Yeah, that's uh, not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be 10,000 in money. So we got to clarify that. Okay. Right. So, yeah, well, there are a number of things uh, in Farmers Nights where there are funded, you know, Army bands, the VSO, but there are also a number of uh, performers that, that just do it on their own. Uh, well, the good house there. <clears throat> they're asked. Charmed you know. into <laughs> Um, about the need. 
Uh, 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 so Stephanie yeah. in the um, Stephanie and I, in all transparency, you know, you've seen our version of this bill, which was exactly the same as Stephanie's. Um, and we incorporated it into our economic development bill right. because our, we don't tend to like to call out specific sectors. So we included it in the hardest hit sectors. You know. But I'm just curious on the marketing, uh, you don't mention in coordination with uh, the current marketing efforts of the state. You don't mention coordinating this with tourism and marketing. And that, I think that is the intention. Um, but it's not said. Okay, so that's the intention. I just want to clarify yeah, that. Before we... Karen, do you want to address that also? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, for the record, Karen Middleman, Executive Director of Vermont Arts Council. Can we just wait until we have you as a witness? You can... Oh, of... sure. Sorry. Uh, so thank you very much for your testimony. Um, the obvious questions here is we, in this community, we sort of have all these things not necessarily covered, but potentially covered yeah. in other pots of money. So for the $10, $10 million that's carved out, we have $20 million of veto loans, which the Arts Council could apply for. Mm -hmm. And if they justified it, they could theoretically get $10 million. Uh, for the $2 million to $4 million, we have CIG grants, which may be applicable to, to those kinds of things. And we, we, didn't, we didn't carve anything out for the arts or any other thing, but we did highlight priority sectors like the arts, okay. like restaurants and lodging and childcare, et cetera. Uh, and then promotion, I guess, where we have a provision in for some of the monies. In, uh, not exactly on point for travel and tourism. Uh, but so did you get any, was there any discussion about, uh, let me back up and say, I was kind of struck when we did the first rounds of grants, uh, actually some members of the business community started speaking up loudly and said, well, they got that treatment. And we did, you know, why did they get it? And we didn't get it. Hmm. And, uh, so there's a lot, a big chunk here of what the amount we were able to find for business recovery grants going to the arts. Did you get any, is there any discussion of why we're segregating out the arts above and beyond, for instance, logic? Well, I think looking at, you know, at this sector and then how much they, they bought, they, this particular section lost, lost, and I'm totally understand. I totally am sympathetic with the the tourism and lodging sector and their big losses. And I don't think it's, I don't think this is exclu as exclusive. And there probably is some overlap with this too, with within that. But um, yeah, I, I don't think I, I didn't see that. I mean, when I think about like. Exclusions and who didn't get weren't able to participate. I'm thinking about equity and about small businesses that maybe had a tough time um, accessing accessing grants, and we talked a lot about that. Um, <coughs> and there's a, and this and this bill has uh, recognizes that equity, and this is part, part of their and part of the model in and part of the model in providing the grants is looking at at at, at that. And equity and um, and small, very small businesses, and and in the commerce committee, we spoke a lot about um, these small businesses that needed help because they they're, they're you know going back early to early COVID days, didn't have their books in order, were small were sole proprietors, didn't didn't know how to act, to access access programs, had largely cash based businesses. You know, there was a lot we found out about about the small businesses that weren't able to able to access and the people that and then we know that the people the organizations that did access the funds were the ones that had their books in order right. who had dedicated staff to say like okay i'm going over the next grant i'll get the next one i'm able to apply and they, you know, they understood it um and this sector it's, these are small a lot of these are very small businesses and i think and this is what I know that the Arts Council can do is sort of is, is, is a lot of hand holding and really work and with what, people. And that's what we did before, right? We 
which carved out a certain amount of money. Yeah, we did. So it cost, it's they, they five million dollars. Yeah. But the need is much greater than five million. Right. So you view this? Um, I don't know if it's different for each piece of pie here, but do you view this as mostly forward thinking or to compensate people for losses that they suffer through? It's losses they suffer in order to get them past. So I think my understanding of this sector is that people have they shrunk that they shrunk down the skeleton crews. They um, you know laid out as many people as they can just to kind of keep their businesses going or their nonprofits going. And so we need the the, the, the grants will be looking at back at, at 2019 and 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 the suffer what they've suffered through COVID. And Karen can give those details much better than I. And then help them sort of jumpstart themselves now. Is it too late? I'm not sure. You know, is it is have we waited too long to do this? I'm not sure either. Like, is this we're hoping that this will jumpstart enough people so they can they can continue on, that they, their nonprofits aren't going to shutter forever, that their business is not going to shut is forever. It, is it your understanding? We'll ask Karen. This is your understanding that a grant could be issued for uh, an arts program that shuttered down and they don't have to reopen with that money. They would reopen they with that money. They don't have to reopen. They can justify that they lost money during that two-year period. Are we going to give money to a group like that that doesn't have any intention of reopening? Right. Well, I was there no provision here that they have to be in business now? Is there? Karen had a. Um, I don't know if Karen sent it to you, but I received it. Um, a one pager on what their. Um, I think she. Said, the, I think the, the the grant of the plan on how to how to distribute these grants. It would, it would be something my hope that people that when you got a grant, your business will be going on. I can't imagine that we would give grants to people. That was because we have this debate in all areas. You know, how oh, much yeah. of this is trying to keep business afloat, go forward, or how much is to, to we can't cover everybody's loss for the last. No, I, yeah, I know you're right. You're absolutely right. You're only going to cover a portion, even if the maximum grant is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We know that these larger organizations have lost far more than that. Right. Um, is the maximum grant for two thousand? Two hundred fifty. That's oh, in, that ten million dollars. That's in what's envisioned in the plan. It's not the bill, is it? No. Okay. No, you don't. They don't have criteria or uh, amounts it. But it is. I for me, this is sort of what we did with with Vita and, and the capital investment program. This is in part. I, I would want it to be for for businesses that are operational now because we yeah. don't want to be giving money it, to businesses that have closed. And so. in my view, it's an economic development opportunity. So yeah. we don't want to, th that is, but, if I'm looking at it from the commerce perspective, this right. is economic development. Okay. And, oh, yeah, and that's yeah. why it was in your committee and it is in ours. It, it is, it's an economic engine for our state, for our state. Our, the creative sector. But I view this, this division is very similar to what we did in economic development. Part is uh, uh, helping compensate people for some for losses, but also it's very it's forward thinking in terms of how to apply this going forward for HVAC systems for right for improvements to their performance spaces or to their museums or to whatever that uh, so that they can be uh, uh, you know code compliant and and prepared for the next pandemic. Right, um, and for the ongoing concerns that they want to bring people back, because we know particularly the creative sector has there's a wariness about returning. There's a wariness about sitting in close proximity with each other, and uh, and, and and so some of this is to improve their spaces so people will feel more comfortable yeah. doing that. Um, I mean, I think we, when we've had this conversation about other businesses, I've said the same thing, and I think no one more than the arts will reinvent themselves after a pandemic and you know not necessarily exist in the same form have less bricks and mortar have more installations have more experiential art so i imagine karen will speak to this but i just don't want us to hamstring everything into fixed cost bricks and mortar because there are lots of exciting creative things happening where they're creating tours around the state of different you know installations or sure outdoor experiences um, or more individualized experiences that you create for yourself that we should give the arts flexibility as well to um, reinvent what an, what an artistic and cultural experience is post-pandemic. Sure, and certainly we, we, you know, what we also think about some of our larger 
historic venues, like our like the the Paramount Theater in downtown Rome, the Flynn Theater. I mean, these are old historic buildings that need to be upgraded so that it's safe. So yeah, you're right. It has to be, you know, more maybe more outdoor concerts, but there also are these historic buildings that need to people need to feel confident in right. going into. And I think you know, I am telling the the old town hall, the town hall is- a, I was gonna say, your town hall is a performance space. It's, you know, it's built prior to the Civil War. So they're, you know, they're trying to bring it up to, to, to current to current codes. Yeah, I think it's just a both and. I mean, there's really new and. exciting art installations being created where you, you know, you're experiencing things differently. And mm -hmm. like Barbarossa in I Essex. I just had a tour of that yesterday. Yeah, so, you know, I just wanna make sure we're not leaving out New ways of experiencing art. Yeah, yeah, that's a really them. good point. I, I I sort of want to relook at our capital grants program as to whether that flexibility is built in there. It's not just bricks and mortar, because I think it does say for capital improvements, and there's other ways to do capital improvements that are not bricks okay. and mortars, or maybe it's not capital improvements, but just, it's a different way to spend money. And but it gets to the same goal. Right. I don't know that it's limited just to the arts. Right. Yeah. right. And I, and my understanding of the capital improvement grants are, and I've just done a, a brief review of H159, how it's looking at it now, and um, is that those are for transformational projects. With a small team. With a small team. <laughs> With a small team. <laughs> yeah. So I would think like those two to four million dollars for upgrades for HVAC system but isn't transformational in a sort yes, of it actually broader. now it, that okay. absolutely will fit into a, a, a CIP. Uh, application. Okay. It's, that's why it's transformational now with a T, lower than this T. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, well, my understanding was it was <laughs> no, no, lower transformational it's project. Like it's no longer for big regional projects. Okay, okay. that's what it I, that's what I understand. Which is, I guess which I'm is just why, behind. no, these, these creative sector grants would fit perfectly at, at, into, I mean, that's what we were thinking of as we went through it, is it would incorporate this bill in that, and I these see. kinds of needs in that. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, you're welcome to stay. Thank you. I'd like to stay. And, and um, David's probably going to. The bill's pretty straightforward. Yeah, forward. it is pretty straightforward. I think you walked us through it. There's probably perhaps a few more details to David. But um, yeah, I'm glad. I'll sit on the side and David can. Well, let's, let's hear from Karen okay. first. Uh, unless you're David. And thank you very you much. Okay. Appreciate the opportunity to share. Uh, Loved working with you on this. No, thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Right, Delighted good. to be with the committee. It's all yours now. For the record, I'm Karen Middleman, Executive Director of the Vermont Arts Council. Thank you. I'm delighted to join you all. And I think um, what I want to say, building on what uh, Representative Jerome said, you know, we worked with that we worked with uh, Representative Jerome and Senator Clarkson on various versions of this bill in direct response to the continued financial distress we're, we're seeing in the sector. And you, your committee's already heard me testify yeah. about this, so I won't go through all the data, but I just, I, I wanna say to the way that we crafted the grant programs, they're specifically geared to the data that we've collected on, um, to, on losses, related to COVID, COVID on the economic harm that our sector has suffered, also on the continued costs of COVID mitigation, like what Stephanie mentioned at the Paramount. We've collected data from a sample of cultural organizations, at mainly theaters and performing arts venues, about their continued costs of responding to the public health harm of COVID. And we've, we've also got both national, regional, and um, state level data on continued audience hesitancy, which Senator Clarkson alluded to. And it's clear that our organizations are still, they're at about 30 to 40% capacity right now because audiences are just hesitant to come back. That's consistent with national market potential data that we've seen that says in the arts and culture sector, we're not gonna see audiences returning to full capacity until probably the fourth quarter of 2022. And that's assuming that COVID really is, is largely behind us, of course, and there's no new variant. So just, you know, to, the, to, the, to your question, Senator Sorokin, about why the arts, it's simply because the sector is devastated and because they're not, they're not coming back. They're, you know, 30 to 40% seating capacity is almost not financially viable for a large theater like the Flynn or the Paramount. So 
while their doors may be open, they may be welcoming audiences back, they're sustaining increased costs to operate in this new COVID environment, and they're just, they're not filling seats. And, you know, downtown Brandon, downtown Rutland, downtown Burlington depends on those organizations getting people in those seats because there are economic engines. So that's the that's the answer to why this sector needs to be helped at, at this particular moment. Um, I know House Commerce heard testimony from Eric Millette at the Paramount, which Stephanie mentioned. They were dark for 18 months and they just reopened in September 2021 after 18 months of zero ticket revenue, zero venue rentals. They opened in September, 2021 with their audience numbers still significantly down. And then they had to add the cost that Stephanie mentioned of deep cleaning, COVID mitigation, vaccine checks. Then Omicron hit. And by December, they were already looking at venue cancellations, national tours being postponed or canceled. And I know that in the first quarter of 2022, they're already back down in a deep hole. So their doors are open, they're back in business, but it doesn't mean that they're okay. Very, very few of our businesses in the creative sector are really okay. Um, so we designed the aid packages in this bill as a bridge to kind of get our businesses and organizations back to some level of stability and safety. And I'm really grateful for everything your committee is doing to try to stabilize businesses across Vermont and particularly great, grateful to the House Commerce Committee for their confidence that a grant program was a more flexible way to deliver aid than a loan program. And their confidence in the Arts Council based on our what we've learned, frankly, over the last two years, developing and implementing four COVID relief programs. So we designed the package, the recovery package that you see in H624 based on that experience. Um, Question. Uh, sure. So first question. Oh, I didn't know if that was a natural breaking point. Karen, I, I just have a question. I'm happy to take questions. Um, I, I'm okay being a bit of a broken record that I think housing is at the center of all of our economic crises right now. And I was glad to see housing kind of mentioned in the $750,000 for restoring vitality. I'm wondering how that how that kind of small amount of money would help. I mean, we see vacant college properties, vacant, like huge vacant spaces. And I've, you know, you've probably been to other communities where they turn an old school into artists' residences and do have a gallery in the gym. I mean, what are we talking about in terms of trying to have um, artist housing and residences because I, I think those could be such a driver of vitality and it's not a lot of money. You're right, it's not a lot of money. I would love to see um, us able to invest more in some co-working and housing spaces, you know, kind of combined work and living spaces for artists um, along the lines of what, you know, many, many communities have done including our own in Bellows Falls, there's a great example of that kind of combined residential and, and artist space. What we envision doing with the $750,000 is probably piloting this program in two or three of the creative zones, two or three areas, um, and helping multiple businesses. For example, the bundle project that Stephanie mentioned in downtown Middlebury was one grant to one project through the Better Middlebury Partnership, which is their downtown alliance, but it benefited 30 or 40 businesses in the downtown. So three, two or three pilot projects, but but they'll have a ripple effect and benefit many artists and businesses. And then if we if it's a successful pilot, we hope to be able to raise private funds to replicate it and expand it in the future. I'd love to see that. But it, it's not really meant to be a major housing bill so much as a focus on downtown vacant storefronts. I mean, right. I mean, so it's, it could have a housing component. Right. If a landlord also had a head space that they could also house artists, but it's really, I believe, I mean, I think our original intention was to fill storefronts with studios and with uh, art spaces okay. that would revitalize. A lot is like thrown into that paragraph. So well, that's kind because, of thrown in. I didn't know well, if there was like, Specific. Well, attention. So that's because I was. We were working on this together, and housing was was potentially a piece we wanted to. Be. We don't want to preclude housing. Yeah, it was part of the the mm -hmm. so this, so opportunity. This, so this is um, yet another example in my mind of the challenges this committee 
faces in terms of where we prioritize this funding because we have a downtown credit program which we're trying to expand that could easily fit here that this the applications here could easily go to the downtown program to get the money and yet we're making the decision here to carve out one specific group as opposed to leaving that to uh, the administer, administrators of the downtown tax credit program just another ch challenge that we face here i'm not sure these kinds of babies would fit into the downtown tax credit program. Well, certainly if you're revital if you're re it, it would fit under better places more and mm -hmm. under um and, uh, and just other things so i a question i have karen is is this just for the performing arts or is it broader than the performing it's all creative sector it's for the, all creative sector businesses and nonprofits. So, so if i'm a jeweler uh i could even though i work alone and i don't interact with the public i could still qualify for a grant here for some of the grants, yes. If they're, So think of, um, uh, the easiest way to, to think of this, I think, is think of the creative sector in industry segments. So let, take the performing arts slice of the creative sector. It includes the organizations we've been talking about, like the Paramount, the Latches, the Barry Opera House, the Flynn, are, are nonprofit cultural organizations. And then it also includes small creative businesses that support the performing arts. So a custom guitar maker who owns her own shop making custom uh, musical instruments or a sound recording studio is defined as a creative business that supports the performing arts. So small creative businesses that support the, cre the, the creative um, production in our state are qualified for these grants, correct? Does that help? Well, uh, yeah, I, it's, an ob it's obvious to me that the performing arts that have to perform in public, certainly in audiences, have been hammered here. I mean, they've been forced to shut down in some cases, not practically, but by law. Right. Uh, but if the but the art world is much bigger than just the performing arts, oh. and I don't know how you uh, elevate them above other businesses. Well, the creative sector includes museums. It includes other places that have been hammered by by public right. right. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just trying to get at, you know, uh, I'm just trying to define what the art world is right, right. covered in this bill. Well, what the creative sector covers. Yeah. And it covers everything from architects to, to crafts, people to museums, uh, uh, costume designers, jewelers, you know, jewelers of the whole range. So where, I guess, could you tell me a little bit about your administration of the $5 million, how you, was that enough where you oversubscribe? How did you prioritize? I mean, uh, was there any targeting with even within your group or if somebody put in an application and they showed financial loss, did they get their money regardless of uh, whether they could had an opportunity to go forward without the money? So um, two different answers to that question, if I may. First, that was a, the $5 million was a program, the Economic Recovery Grant Program, that we administered in partnership with ACCD. And so it was, it, and it was initially run, if you recall, through ACCD. And, in, and what we did in the early stages of that program was to identify a set of, um, the set of businesses according to standard industry codes that should be considered for that, that money. That was, that was specifically, if you recall, for cultural nonprofits. So it was for one slice of the creative sector. It was for cultural nonprofits, not for for-profit businesses. So we identified for ACCD the list of organizations that should be considered for that set aside. And then they, they initially administered the grant program. Later, because of various issues that you're familiar with, so I won't go into, the money didn't get out the door. Um, and so we, the Arts Council, took over administration of the final pot of money, the final phase. Um, but we were largely administering a program that ACCD had developed. If what you want to understand is how would we approach spending the money in H624, that that would be given out by a very different model. Is that what you want to know? Is, is that the uh, question? Yes, I was trying to learn from the past, but yep. Matt, do you have a vision or a handout <coughs> as to what you see uh, how you administer this money? 
Yes, I mean, I think one of the things we learned from the past was that the grant formulas that we tried in partnership with ACCD were way too restrictive. I know you've heard about that, so I won't rehash that, but the grant formula and the requirements for applicants were way too restrictive. So we've looked for models um, for this grant program that were more flexible, less onerous, less restrictive. And as I think Representative Jerome mentioned, we are, um, we're taking a model from the Colorado Office of Economic Opportunity that was very successful uh, in giving out aid to nonprofits and businesses. And I, I can send you, I have a kind of one pager that walks through that program, uh, which I'd be happy to send. But basically, it's it takes the indicators of COVID harm that are identified in the Treasury final rule. There are five indicators of economic harm, as you probably know. Financial insecurity, decreased revenue, increased costs due to COVID, challenges meeting payroll and other operating costs, and capacity to weather financial hardship. Those are defined by ARPA, not by us, and by Treasury, rather. We take those, we put them into a rubric, and, if, and an organization that applies for the funding must present their pre-pandemic financials. So they're 20, for most organizations, that's 2019 financials. Um, a three-year financial summary looking at 2019, 2020, 2021, an accounting of all other pandemic assistance they've received from government sources, um, and a narrative describing the uh, presenting evidence of their COVID impact. And then we have an evaluation rubric that we would give to our review panels because all of our most of our grant programs are reviewed by external peer review panels that we convene. That way we can bring in expertise that our staff might not have. So we would convene a panel and we would ask them to evaluate the severity of pandemic harm of these organizations. And then once they met the threshold of, of pandemic harm established by Treasury, they would receive a flat grant based on their pre-pandemic operating revenue. So I know I went through that really quickly. I can send oh, you I all. I followed it all to the end. Okay. And what? They would, they would qualify for a flat grant. Of, Correct. On that pre-pandemic. What does that translate? What does that plan? So uh, let's, so grant paper. amounts would vary ba from um, say 5,000 to 250 or $300,000. The range obviously depends on what, funding is available for the program, but just for argument's sake, let's say that's the range. We would establish, um, uh, we would segment organizations and applicants by operating budget. And so if you were at the bottom, if you if you had a tiny little organization, you'd get the bottom tier, you'd get a $5,000 grant. You'd be a, a, a largest organizations with the largest pre-pandemic revenue would receive the maximum award, as long as they met the threshold of pandemic harm established by Treasury. Does that so, make sense? Yeah, well, it does. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand, and I'm not sure I agree with it, but you're saying so based upon your revenue, pre-pandemic revenue, that would determine the size of the grant and not based upon your profits and losses or your difficulty, it would just be what your revenue was? So yes and no, because you have to meet the threshold of pandemic harm. So you have, and you're, re you're ranked by the panel based on severity of pandemic loss. So you don't, if you don't meet those criteria, if you didn't, if you didn't incur substantial financial harm, you're not going to receive a grant, right? You have to meet that threshold. But once you meet the threshold, we're yeah. not giving you a grant that, that is backfilling for specific dollar amount of your losses. We're giving you a grant that is a flat operating grant to help you with your fixed costs moving forward. That's correct. It's not, it's a very different approach. Um, and it's one that was successful in Colorado and many other states, which is basically, I mean, take the example of, of, of an organization that, like the Paramount that was shuttered for 18 months. We're never gonna replace all of their losses, right? right? right. We're, not, we're not aiming to backfill, to fill, to, to make everybody whole. We're aiming to stabilize our organizations so that they can survive and move forward. Do you have to meet all five of those criteria in the no. just one? So if you suffer any revenue loss, you qualify? No, it's a rubric. So you get scored, like you get scored on each of those indicators, and then the your this total score is added up. So that that allows flexibility so that if someone was hit harder in one area than others, the they can be those can be weighed. So somehow there's a, a weighting system and you have to reach a threshold of all five combined 
right. to get in the door, and then once you get in the door, you get a grant. Right. The because the Treasury uh, guidance does not specify that an organization in order to re a business in order to receive aid must meet all five of those criteria. They don't, that's not required. So uh, we're okay. just, yeah. I understand that, but one of the issues that we've dealt with over the last couple of years is that the, at least on the recovery grants early on, the administration wanted a base of just on lost revenue. It was one of the things that was allowed by the Treasury guideline, and they that's the way they went because it was easy for them mm -hmm. to administer. Uh, and some of us had some problems with that in terms of targeting the money in the best way possible. But you're looking at a combination of factors. Uh, the yeah, I agree. It's easier to look at simply look at a drop in revenue, but we don't believe that's the best way to make sure that the money gets to the organizations that are genuinely struggling and need it the most. So. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about equity for a second because I heard it mentioned, I don't see it anywhere in the bill here, and I know it's something you've paid a lot of attention to, but in, in all of these grant making activities and initiatives, I worry a lot about worsening divides because so many organizations run by immigrants, new Americans, and people of color were already operating on a shoestring, already operating very informally. Now they've suffered through the pandemic and are not going to be able to show the same books and records as others and are going to experience sort of even more setbacks, I believe. Um, so I'm wondering how you're thinking about that in the rubric and how Colorado thought about it. I mean, there has to be some measure at some point for equity beyond just pandemic harm to create a better outcome for people than they had before. Absolutely, and I'm glad you asked that because I think um, some committee members know that in our administration of CARES Act grants and the ARPA grants that we receive from the federal government, we worked with Vermont Humanities on both of those grant programs and we used an equity lens we we made equity one of our criteria so that we were sure that we were serving BIPOC-led organizations and uh, organizations in our smallest, most rural communities, that we got a good geographic distribution of grants, and that the other thing we learned um, as a consideration, an equity consideration, is not just about um, how you evaluate applications, but it's about the outreach that you do. So. Having a long application window is really an equity consideration because an organization with a large development department that's scanning funding opportunities on a daily basis is going to snap up your dollars if there's a short application window. And that small struggling um, you know, micro business run by one person who has two jobs and may have English challenges may take some time to even learn that you have a funding opportunity. So outreach and time and extensive communication are incredibly important. We've learned a lot by administering these grant programs and I, we're, we're not doing nearly as well as I wish we were, to be quite honest. I think that's a struggle for all funders, um, especially in a small rural state like Vermont, where making sure that you're reaching everybody is so important, but so difficult. But we have a lot of existing partnerships that help us deliver that the word. So Clemens Family Farm and the Abenaki Artists Association of Vermont, for example, will will partner with us to get the word out. We Clemens has hosted funding workshops that we've done to reach artists in their network that we know for whatever reasons are just not taking advantage of our funding opportunities. And so rather than waiting for them to come to us, we go to them and we do a funding workshop at Clemens and we listen to them and we hear what their needs are and we we give them a lot of technical assistance. My, my staff is fantastic. Um, if I can toot the horn of my wonderful staff for a minute, they do a really, really wonderful job of time on the phone, hand-holding, explaining, help with applications. And that's one of the things we're absolutely committed to. So, uh, so you're, you won't be first come for a Is that no. your, Is that in your guidelines too? Or in your yes. It definitely will not be for us to come for service. Are these guidelines already in your mind or on paper as to? Yeah, could we see the guidelines, Karen? So we don't have written guidelines yet because we don't have a program yet, but we oh, will. No. I, I will send you the, the one, the, it, it's a two page summary of how we would design the rubrics and what we anticipate the grant amounts would be. That's that's the best I have at this point. The rest is 
still in the conversation stage. And it largely depends, to be honest, on the scope of the grant program, the scope of the funding that we receive, because we'll have to scale it appropriate, you know, bending, um, depending on the grant amounts. And if I can, I if I might say one more thing, circling back to a question that I believe you asked, Senator Sirac, and I'm most concerned about you're asking about the overlap between um, what's in H624 and some of the programs that your committee has come up with. I'm really most concerned about this, the micro businesses, the tiny sole proprietors um, that Senator Rom Hinsdale and Senator Clarkson mentioned, who just didn't take advantage of earlier funding opportunities, either because they didn't know about them or because they were just intimidated, frankly. I worry that the two grant programs in H159 will not serve those small struggling micro businesses. And then I'm worried about um, cultural nonprofits. I, I think the financials uh, and the situation of nonprofits is just fundamentally different than a for-profit business. And they don't always, they, you can't have a one size fits all formula for both of those uh, so groups. In the Colorado plan, as you mentioned, I thought you put in there the word nonprofit. Is Colorado program limited to nonprofits? Theirs was for both creative businesses and nonprofits. Say that again. Say it Theirs again. was the Colorado program was for both. Yeah, for both. Okay. For profit creative businesses and nonprofits. Uh, one more follow up question, sir. Uh, so I really appreciate the fact that you're recognizing that the big operators will be all ready to go and come in and they're giving enough a window there for the smaller people to be doing outreach. I think the federal government puts it in the restaurant revitalization program. They actually said only small businesses could apply in the first few months. So it was a big change when the company would take all the money. So I think it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a small point uh, overall, but I'm looking at the creative sector space in vacant downtown. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it indicates is that uh, a grantee may also use funds to lease residential space in the same building. Maybe the guitar maker that you spoke about earlier, if that person, particularly the micro business, the sole proprietor, leases the retail space for uh, manufacture, sale, whatever the case may be of their product, may they also use the vacant space, the residential space, uh, to lease residential space in the same building for a period of up to three years for their personal use? Is that the intent? I think that was the intent uh, to allow that flexibility that it could be residential combined with business. Well, I guess the question that I would have is in other grant programs that we've had for business revitalization, uh, have we included the personal use uh, of the grant monies for uh, the individual who may be the proprietor of that business. And I don't think that that's something that we've done. We have done. And I don't think that's really an appropriate use of the money. So I would, I would strongly question that particular section. Or uh, <clears throat> the notion, I, I can understand the notion of uh, adding the space in the same building in a downtown area, but I think there ought to be some guidelines and guide rails around that so that we, what we're not doing is we're is, is creating a, uh, a personal uh, gain from the use of grant funds in these specific circumstances. The goal is to do the grant on the basis of the business or the sector, but not the individual. I just disagree. I mean, we, I don't know that we funded everything, but we have heard about startup kind of yeah. in, like, like Matt how Dunn's thing. Yeah, Matt Dunn's thing was, we didn't fund that, but we have talked, I mean, there are lots of things where we're looking at someone who needs their fix, their fit up cover. Like, and usually it's a person, it's an entrepreneur, an artist, somebody who needs live, work, space. Yeah. Live, work, we space. have not, not had that conversation. I mean, that's not right. like, Coming out of, out of space. Well, I would suspect that if you look at the federal guidelines, I would be surprised if the federal guidelines would pro prohibit the personal benefit in the first place. And I think that's just something that ought to be examined. And well, I would strongly a, object to it, quite frankly. Yeah, it's a personal benefit and a community benefit, I think, quite frankly, to have spaces filled. But I think there are many artists, the reason we included this is if you had a big enough vacant space in a 
is with a big window. This happens a lot in Europe. You could have a studio in the front and curtains and screens and a, and a bed in the back. Lots of artists live in their studios. Well, you can certainly do it so, with a retail yeah. space. You can yeah, do it with a exactly. manufacturing space. Yeah, you can do it with why, any kind of space. But that's part of why we included the housing. But, but as I say, that's not something that we've certainly thought about including in any other kind of grant program. We've talked about farm worker design. housing, entrepreneur housing. I mean, there are yeah, a lot you know of farm worker housing, entrepreneur housing. We have talked a lot yeah. about workers who live close to where they work. I just don't think that's an uncommon conversation for this. We haven't, we haven't uh, it's not banned in our previous bill. I don't think it was envisioned. I think it gives an unfair advantage in terms of if the grants were going to be sized appropriately to the need, you're basically saying somebody who gets rental space as part of their grant gets more money than person has to pay for their own housing in an apartment. Uh, I think that's a matter of equity, if nothing else. But anyhow, yeah. I mean, we, we, we will talk about that some more. I, I have a question. So I totally agree with you that, uh, and I hope that the guidelines that come out, uh, if the VITA program succeeds, uh, um, have something, either staggered applications or not first come, first serve in them uh, when they come in. But could you just, uh, just to play devil's advocate, can you, if we put in our bill that the arts, performing arts and arts and culture get priority for the VEDA and capital investment grants, do you, I, I, I know you would, would prefer this, but what is wrong with the agency when they see the wealth of information and applications coming in for them to decide who needs the money the most? So we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna I know we're gonna get feedback from the rest of the business community. Why does this one sector get this carve out and nobody else does? Well, and we did identify those sectors as a yeah. priority. So yeah. we've done that. My concern first, I should say I have I think the Vita program has great potential for our sector. I and I have huge respect for Cassie. And her whole staff. So what I'm about to say is no is no uh, reflection on Vita. I think it's a wonderful program. I am concerned about those small micro businesses and the smaller nonprofits, frankly, that are not. They're going to be deterred by fear of taking on more debt, even though I understand it's a forgivable loan, and they're going to be deterred by the onerous application process, no matter how flexible Cassie and her staff try to make it. And I, that's, I'm just speaking from experience, having um, spoken to many of our cultural organizations, nonprofits and micro businesses that have tried, that have you know, faced those really steep hurdles. And 60% of our cultural nonprofits have budgets of under $250,000. They're really small. They're not going, they're going to be intimidated by a forgivable loan program. I've got data on 230 cultural organizations. Those are, again, nonprofits, museums, theaters, um, and the like that received some form of COVID aid in 2020 and 2021. Of those 230, only 83 got PPP. PPP was a fantastic program. It benefited all of our, most of our larger organizations, but 60% of our organizations are not, are small to medium size. And they're just, I, I worry that that's the group I'm concerned about, that smaller nonprofits are just not going to go for the VITA program. So, and similarly, I have concerns about the capital investment grants. When I look at the language of the bill, the criteria for evaluating grants say trans, the transformational nature of the project for the region and transformational projects that will pro provide each region of the state with the opportunity to attract businesses and create jobs. And so I've heard, I, I understand and I have a huge respect for what you are trying to do with that program, but that language is still in the final version of the bill unless I, I'm understanding it. And I worry that once it gets to the administration phase, because um, I, you know, as a funder, I know how, the, how that happens. You get from the legislative intent, which was one thing, to the language of the guidelines and how it's actually administered, which is a whole other thing. Um, and I worry that that program is not going to serve the needs of many of the of the cultural nonprofits that need 
really urgently need HVAC and uh, assistance and other facility upgrades related to COVID that would be fully ARPA um, eligible, but so, that they won't they won't get their needs met. Just just a small point, but use the word nonprofits. Would it also apply to for profits? Small for -profits. in that program, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, yeah. What about a solution? I mean, it, it is possible that we could allow the VITA program to do a carve out and contract it out to you. Uh, at, the very, at the very least, that would allow VITA to sort of size up how much money they have and where the arts and culture fit in. I mean, we, we have a $17 million program here. Uh, we only allow $20 million. I don't think both of them are going to survive. So if we wound up with $20 million, is $17 million of that of this recovery money going to go just to the arts? So, I mean, I can see that it would obviously be preferable to you to get the full amount, but your other concerns you're saying is administrative difficulty, the small business first come to a certain. I think we could take care of that. What we are put in a difficult position is how, how we were going to prioritize the various sectors and to what extent. And I almost, that's what way we did what we did it because we want to sort of leave it to somebody else to make those hard decisions. Uh, but I think I to give the flexibility. I mean, I just don't know whether uh, you know, the needs are, are that much greater for the arts than they are for lodging or for childcare or for all that stuff. And, uh, so, yeah. that's, that's so, mm -hmm. So we, Karen, as you know, we took out it partly because of the ARPA treasury rule finally having come down with the uh, capital investment uh, grant program. We did take out that in the first section. Uh, we did in its definition, we did take out the word regional. So it is, it, 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 it's, I, I would hope, and I think one of the main concerns here where I think you would partner either way with Vita is the outreach piece because you're absolutely right. The outreach piece is going to be critically important. One of the pluses is Vita has, I think, the staff to provide some of the individual attention for our businesses that don't are are, are smaller that don't fit into the you don't fit easily into any particular box. So I'm hopeful that this could also be, and perhaps with a carve out. Uh, be actually very productive for a whole range of businesses, but I think it's totally dependent on the outreach we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, Karen, there's a whole nother direction we could have taken equity that I know a lot of arts and cultural organizations are very aware of, which is access. Um, and, you know, as we talk about what's government's role in helping any organization reopen or any you know, new housing come come into existence, we still have to think about who's most left behind. And so I know I've talked to many arts organizations that say they've already had an educational mission and an access mission and tried to make sure there's either a sliding scale or some way for people to participate in their programming and offerings. And I, I do think that would need to be part of the rubric going forward for what government spends um you know I, I know these are organizations that are are struggling but you know we also need to make sure that um what's the value i mean arts make life worth living but are they only available to some people who can afford to enter a museum or a theater we have to make sure that we're giving everyone access to the arts coming out of a traumatic event series of events like we just went through so i'd just be looking for that as well in in the language of what ultimately comes out is i believe in funding the arts because it makes life worth living coming out of a pandemic um but only if it the equity also extends to each organization ensuring that they have some sort of access component that they are proposing and to that point the colorado program that we're leaning on quite heavily as a model here, included in their rubric, whether or not an organization's community or audience includes historically excluded groups or communities with lack of access to significant resources. 
And that's, we have an equity, we have equity language that we plan to build into our, evaluate, our evaluation rubric as well. So I'm glad you asked that. Sure. Is, there's been a lot of criticism, as you well know, of the PPP program and how it didn't really meet its intended purposes, uh, wasn't targeted enough, the money was directed to the bottom line as opposed to hiring more people. Has there been any segregation of that criticism uh, that it doesn't exist the PPP loans that went to arts? The arts community or to the nonprofit community. Uh, you know, I think I view those folks as less business oriented and maybe there's less, uh, the, the money was more effective in the arts world than in the rest of. I don't know if there's been any studies or you. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I don't know of any, I would just be able to answer anecdotally about the organizations that I know that receive PPP. There were only um, 80 some, 83, as I said, uh, in Vermont. But um, those are cultural, those are the nonprofits. I'm not speaking to for profit businesses. But I know most of them found the program, um, the, the benefit to be incredibly helpful in, in um, you know, kind of navigating and retaining staff. But most, I mean, the, the real issue with most of the federal and state aid was that it was an absolute lifeline in 2020 and 2021, but none of that aid was designed with the awareness that Omicron would happen or that the losses would continue so long. So that's why we're in the situation we are now with, with needing another aid package, because that, that aid just, it was, it was a huge help, but it wasn't enough. Do you communicate with, it, with your counterparts around the country and do you get any general feeling of how Vermont's done with its AIDS packages compared to other states. We've had some anecdotal information that we mm -hmm. eat the country and how much help we've given out to the business community per capita in terms of our programs. Do you just anecdotally get any feedback on that? Yeah, I talk mainly to I mean, uh, uh, to colleagues at state arts agencies in New England and, and across the country and it varies as you might imagine. I mean, you know, states with massive budgets are uh, like New York and California are just able to give out so much more aid to the creative sector and to the for-profit business sector. Um, it right close to home, I know New Hampshire just passed a bill, a bill called Save Our Granite Stages, which is their version of the Save Our Stages, the Shuttered Venues Grant that's specifically to help those performing arts venues that just are still struggling. Um, and Massachusetts is probably the most remarkable example. They have a long history of very strong, um, vigorous support for the arts. And they just passed a $60.1 million bill from the state's ARPA COVID recovery fund that, the, that my counterpart, the Massachusetts State Arts Council is gonna be giving out and making one-time relief grants to individual artists and cultural organizations in fiscal 23. 60 million? Yep. Yeah. Right. Well, I, uh, the news from New Hampshire almost counters everything else they're enacting. <laughs> yes. Almost. Not quite. Any other questions? No, oh, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion. Yeah. Stay tuned. Uh, committee, we have Representative Kimball coming in at 1030 uh, to continue going through the workforce capacity bill. How do you, how do you refer to the bill other than by number? Uh, uh, H703, <laughs> our workforce bill. What's that? We call it the workforce bill. Workforce, okay. Your workforce bill is really a tour de force. <laughs> So, uh, it is huge. Which, uh, a lot of, a lot of, and yet, as we're finding out, not everybody, EMSs yeah. or you know, it's amazing that groups have already come to at least me. I'm sure to everybody else too, and said, "Gosh, we have this workforce challenge too." I mean, EMS in particular is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you have any know. questions? Let me know. I'm happy to provide. David, you have. Anything to add, really? Okay. The we bill is really about as straightforward as a bill as I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Uh, I guess the only thing I'd like to add is that um, the creative economy is is huge, and when 
on the floor of the house there was asked for a definition of the creative economy oh, yeah. and um in uh it cover in the strategic plan of uh, creative network they list over 110 base codes and so i think when we're talking you know, performing arts and different it, it is it is much much broader when we're looking at the this profit and and not the profit this body actually enabled the first creative economy uh, work that was done by the Arts Council. We got the report we have the right 2009, and it's a huge range. It, it's a, the creative sector is vast and, and employs a ton of people, and it represents a significant percent of our economy. Yeah, and so, so it's great. Just so I, remember, I remember my question, and I don't know if you could mm -hmm. answer it. Um, the, we did one stage of the uh, the grant bills, we excluded, we had language in there that was excluding groups or downs, downsizing the grants of groups that were about to receive added financial help. What we had in mind was the restaurants and the shuttered venues. Right. So right. Uh, I, one of the things that will follow up, I just want to know, I guess Karen's no longer with us, I want to know how much that shuttered venue would specify helped the because well, you know. it, it, it builds upon the equity argument in terms of how we're helping right. the performing arts at least the house they didn't do anything for okay. other grants but they did this and then that builds upon the feds who did something special for some right. that they didn't do in that series that program. program was totally are we offline no we're fine so that i just have to choose my language carefully the shuttered venue program was a huge screw up. There were uh, it was uh, it took forever for it to get rolled out properly. The challenge in the reverse was true for the restaurants, which is they got it up and going, and then all those priority crowds got all the money, and then most of our restaurants, like Matt's, uh, most of our restaurants in Vermont did not get any money. The reverse was true with shuttered venues. Correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie, which is. <laughs> It took forever to get that program worked out. There were huge uh, glitches with it. And I'm actually not sure how many of our, uh, our performing arts community, I, I'm not sure how we ended up benefiting. It would have to be a good uh, list to get from yeah. from Karen because yeah. some did get, I know that yeah. they did get some, um, but I do know that it was extremely complicated. Oh, it, and long and took forever. And, and over so, and exceeded that anchor. Yeah, but whether it took forever or not, if I, I don't know, know that, yeah, I just want to know how that factors in to their eligibility in the size of the grants, yeah, because they had an extra pot of money that other people didn't have. So, yeah, I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Oh, let's ask her. Okay. Um, but you will be receiving this it's a February 28th memo that the House Commerce received on all of the the uh, outline of this economic of the Colorado, oh, the Colorado and I think a lot of those answers. We have uh, she, she can just send it to you. Okay. Extremely helpful memo. Okay. Um, you email okay. her? Would you be kind of to mm -hmm. ask also what the results were for Vermont with uh, the shuttered venue? That'd be great. I still want to spend time with whether it's Cassie or Joan or both about businesses on a timeline where they are completely out of luck. Um, I mean, I know Tom lives on brought this up with restaurants who that opens like in the two months before the pandemic. And, you know, when, even that whole year of the, fir of the first year of the pandemic, the collective, the collective wisdom was that this was three months and then over or six months and then over. We kept pushing out the timeline and projects you know, developed and sought funding and tried to, you know, build, build new efforts, quit jobs, you know, people made moves in, in, in the, in some parts of the pandemic that may or may not have federal eligibility. Cassie in the email said to me, it's very complicated. They have to prove more. I still want to know what that looks like and make sure we're not completely precluding those folks, if federal language still creates a path for a business that started in the early stages of the pandemic or an, or an arts effort that was, you know, uh, building its capital in the early stages of the pandemic, that they 
have some shot at this. Well, the language that we change at the end gives them the authority to look at that if there's yeah. unusual circumstances. And that'll be decided in the guidelines they come up with after right. the joint fiscal office. So I mean, I never, so in contact with them. Yeah, um, I know we're giving Essex a lot of love already, but you know, if like the Essex experience is a really great example. The Essex experience Essex. is a Essex, a great example of a really dynamic hub that's trying to create arts experiences and breweries that you know we heard from, and just having another example of an arts entity that's trying to do something really you know dynamic and new that started its effort right around the time of the pandemic and or it, and as i understand it outside of committee are being told they might not be eligible for anything and so i just like to better understand our responsibility or consideration for those kinds of organizations before we pass a bill that just says we're giving money to the same project. as you're going through the bill upstairs essentially our approach was we give general guidelines in the bill but we let the agency work with joint fiscal mm -hmm. more detailed guidelines to the joint fiscal committee so the legislature we didn't feel like we could get so much because when you deal with a business there's so many different examples that could come up and so we left those details till later on but we didn't want to give up total uh, sure. discretion to the administration so they're still being developed that's the approach we're doing.